Today, I'm going to be answering one of the most common questions I get from my students, and that is, how do I maximally exploit recreational players when we're playing deep stacked so that I can have a gigantic win rate early in the tournament or in cash games? And today, we're going to be discussing exactly that in a video that I made for my students inside of PokerCoaching.com. And three of the main things we're going to be discussing are how to take advantage of players who drastically overvalue strong but non-nut hands, like pocket aces after the flop. It's a great hand, but not if your opponent wants to put in 500 big blinds. So we're going to discuss how to play against players like that. We're also going to discuss how to play against players who do not bluff catch often enough, especially on the river. I know a lot of you tell me your opponents are extreme calling stations, but I promise you, if you want, or if you frequently put them in a spot where they have to put all their money in by the river, uh, they're not going to be calling stations for all their money. They're calling stations for a little bit of money, but not for all of it. And you have to be willing to put these players to the test. And also, we're going to discuss how to take advantage of players who play poorly in multi-way pots, which is going to be a lot of your opponents. Um, like I said, this video is from inside the PokerCoaching.com premium section for members. If you want to get a big discount right now to get access to this video and many, 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 many more inside of Poker Coaching Premium, check out PokerCoaching.com slash holiday sale. All right, let's get to the video. Hello there, Sharks. I'm John from Little for PokerCoaching.com here today going through a webinar discussing exploiting recreational players when you are playing deep stacked. Exploiting recreational players when deep stacked. The question was essentially, what is the best way to navigate the early levels against a field of mostly recreational players? Mark says, sound like good World Series of Poker prep. That is accurate. World Series of Poker is here. I don't know when you all are will be watching this recording, but the World Series of Poker is here, and early in World Series of Poker tournaments, people are making mistakes left and right. I just returned from playing the Poker Masters, the Super High Roller Bowl, and no one was making any errors. Even the, you know, call them weaker players were still playing fine, right? You have to realize, whenever you're playing in games against players who are not so great, very often they will just make mistakes. So the question is, what mistakes are they prone to make so that you can put them into spots where they are likely to make those mistakes, right? And, um, well, very simply, you have to realize that each player will make specific mistakes, right? And you have to realize it's also not so difficult to pinpoint the type of player your opponent is. Whenever you go to, let's say, a random $500 World Series of Poker tournament, Everyone's not going to make the same errors. The idea of, okay, these players make these mistakes is not going to be great because some people are going to be way too loose and insane. Some people are going to be way too tight and straightforward. If you raise and someone three bets you, your automatic thought should not be, they have the nuts, I fold. Because some people are going to three bet a ton. It should also not be, people three bet a ton, so I'm going to four bet every time, right? You have to figure out what each opponent does and adjust accordingly. I feel like I'm a broken record. I say this all the time, but it's true right? That said, there are some common mistakes people make. We're going to go through four of them. Mark says, that begs the question, why would you want to play in high stakes, tough tournaments? Because you are going to have some edge if you're a very strong player, because in the field, there's something like 20%, 25% non-professionals. And the thing is, is very often you don't know the errors the non-professionals are going to make, although it often becomes very clear. And, um, some of their their EV loss is going to be going to you. The way you can think about it is, let's say you're playing Super High Roller Bowl, $300,000 buy-in tournament with four recreational players. It's got the calculator here. Show some quick and dirty math. Four players, let's presume they are going to lose at minus 30% ROI, which I think is very reasonable. So you do 0.3 times 4 equals. This is how much money is going to be chopped up among the remaining 18 people. 1.2 buy-ins divided by 18 people is 0 0.066667. That means your ROI, if you're a good player, assuming no rake, which there was no slash minimal rake, is going to be 7% times $300,000. Whoops. Not 600. $300,000. Oh my god, not 63. 
300 equals 20,000 bucks. You go there, you show up, you have a lot of variance, you play for a day on average, you make $20,000. Sound like a good deal? If you're okay with variance, it's fine. I, I, I would do uh, most anything in a day for $20,000 personally. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not even hurting for money. So it's like if $20,000 is a good edge, right? So what about um, $10,000 tournaments? There, the field's probably 30-ish percent recreationals. So when you're looking at a 30 percent, I'm sorry, a, a, um, a $10,000 tournament, you start finding more, we'll call them pros that are just like not as good, who are going to be losing like 5 percent or 10 percent. Not a lot, but a little bit. And that equity goes to the good players. But imagine we have, let's say, 30% of the field. Let's say it's a 100-person tournament, right? And let's say 30 of them are minus... Uh, let's say 20 of them are minus 30%. So that's six buy-ins divided by the remaining 80 people, which is actually not accurate. But imagine that's the case. That's 7.5% ROI for everyone times $10,000 equals 750 bucks. Not great. To be fair, I, w I would, I mean, maybe this is egotistical to say, I think that I'm going to be a decent amount better than the like marginal pros. And to be fair, probably not quite as good as the absolute best pros. So the way this would work out for me, Jonathan Little, is I probably end up with, it's probably more like this, this buy-in, these uh, six buy-ins get divided by like 50 people because instead of divided by 80, because um, 30 of those players are going to roughly break even, right? So 50 divided by, uh, what, 50? 50 divided by 50 is 10%, clearly. Or 50, whatever it is. 10% ROI, right? So that's 1000 bucks. I probably get out the door with a little bit less than that because I'm not as good as the absolute best player in the world, right? And so that maybe gives me like 700, 750 bucks ROI, something like that. So again, would you show up to a tournament, accept some variance, and make 750 bucks in the day? For some people, that's fine. For some people, it's not. Right? The nice thing about small field tournaments, though, is that even though you have a low edge, there's actually not all that much variance because it's only 100 people, right? You win sometimes. Or only 20 people, you win sometimes. So that's always quite nice. But that's the merit slash value of playing small field events is that they often don't take all that much time. All these events are one or like two-day tournaments usually. Um... Also, they don't, they don't charge much rake at all. Notice if you're playing a tournament where you have, let's say, a World Series of Poker tournament where you have 50% ROI in a $1,500 tournament, $750, bucks, but then they're taking out, I don't know, $200 rake. So now you're making $550, right? Basically, there, there is no rake if you buy in on time in the, the super high roller tournaments or high roller tournaments, so that's great. The venue's nice. It's a good experience. It's not difficult, right? You go to the Aria, which is a nice place. They give you free food from nice places. That's a good deal. So it's like, it's just, it's easy and good and nice and it is high stress, high risk, etc. But if you've done your math, you've done your work away from the table, you, you can kind of calculate your edge, even though there is going to be a lot of variance. You have to make sure you understand that variance is okay. So what do these recreational players do wrong? Again, I'm going back to the mindset of I'm playing a thousand person tournament against a lot of people who are going to be making very clear mistakes. Four things people do way too much, in my opinion is they overvalue premium preflop hands, both preflop and after the flop. They do not bluff catch enough on the river when facing a large bet that kind of commits them. They call behind too often preflop, resulting in lots of multi-way pots. And they call three bets before the flop too often. So let's go through each of these and discuss adjustments. So first, they overvalue premium preflop hands. Meaning... Well, why? Because premium preflop hands don't get dealt all that often. You don't get aces all that often, right? And for that reason, these recreational players think that they should not be folding these hands unless the board comes out really, 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 really bad, right? So if you know they're not going to be folding their aces post-flop, what do you want to do? Well, you want to make hands that can beat aces. Which hands beat aces? Suited connected hands right? Suited connected hands and pairs beat aces. So when they raise with a reasonable range, which is going to contain all their strong hands, plus, you know, like let's presume they are raising the straight GTO range. If anything, you're probably going to want to three bet a little bit less often with the you know GTO range of hands containing suited connectors and suited aces and small pairs, right? You essentially want to call 
with hands that benefit from having a deep stack to pot ratio, recognizing that you're going to give up a little bit of value in the form of you know, preflop fold equity, because they're not going to fold to preflop three bets anyway. We're going to discuss that in a bit. And also, you are not going to win quite as many like 10 big blind pots where they raise, you three bet, they call, they check the flop, you bet, they fold. You're giving up that in exchange for the times where you're not going to get blown off of your jack 10 suited three bet when they four bet you huge. So that's a good thing. And you're also um, going to just like randomly get dumped 150 big blinds or whatever it is whenever you can beat aces. So call more often with hands that flop really well, right? And then when you do flop the effective nuts or turn the effective nuts, whatever, you're usually going to want to raise immediately to start building a pot so that you can get the deep stack in. This is all presuming we're kind of deep stacked early in a tournament, right? What a lot of people do wrong is they slow play the flop, looking to raise the turn or the river. And I don't love that. If there's ever a spot where these players do start making big folds, it's on the river whenever you decide to put in a big raise. They're going to think, oh man, they trapped me. I guess I have to fold. But say someone does raise and you call with, um, I don't know, six, five of hearts. And it comes eight, seven, four, two spades. If they bet, just raise immediately. Don't slow play. Sometimes the spade's going to come and scare them. Sometimes they're just going to think, okay, they trapped me and they're going to fold on the river if you do decide to put in a raise then. But quite often, these players will just put you on a draw. I just did an episode of A Little Brain Fuel where I went through some hands from um, the, the $25,000 tournaments at the Poker Masters. And multiple people in the chat said something along the lines of, they raised the flop, so I'm putting them on a flush draw. And that's a common thought process of recreational players. They think they raised me, they must have a draw. Of course, some people are going to think they raised me, they must have the nuts. But the thing is, is that even if they think you have the nuts, they're still not holding their aces, right? So what will happen is a lot of these players will put you on a draw and just re-raise. And then all of a sudden, we get 80 big blinds in on the flop where you have the nuts, right? Which is clearly great. So you want to generally just go ahead and raise the flop immediately when you have it. I know it may seem overly straightforward, overly simplistic, not creative, but uh, you got to realize that actually is kind of creative. If everyone else slow plays and you don't, <laughs> you're the creative one. Um, and, and often you'll just find that you want to raise with the effective nuts when you are deep stacked because you want to get money in the pot, right? When you do have the nuts and someone bets, don't immediately say, raise, you know, don't, don't get all hyped up. Don't, don't stand up. Don't get excited. Look as if you're trying to be creative and put a play on them. I'm not even going to say to Hollywood at all. Actually, I don't do any of the Hollywooding. I just take my normal time to put my money in the pot. But what a lot of people do wrong, especially in small stakes games, is they get really excited when they think they're about to stack somebody, <laughs> as you maybe should, right? And you have to suppress whatever feelings you have that may translate into obvious tells. So many times, I mean, I'm going to, I'll say this here. I, I was playing in the super high roller bowl. I was playing against good player, but, you know, slightly on the recreational side who went when I had aces and he had flop three of a kind. Now, look, I've watched a ton of tape on my opponents. I spent basically every free seconds I had over the last month watching and taking notes on my opponents in the super high roller bowl events because they show a lot of like day one play, right? I'm mainly concerned with day one play because uh, you got to make it through day one first. But um, I was, I've watched a lot of footage on my opponents. I've taken lots of notes and I don't know what it was my opponent did, but something somewhere made me uh, cautious with pocket aces on a jack seven, seven board. To be fair, I was against small blind and big blind. They could both have a lot of sevens. Um, but I don't know, something made me a little bit cautious. 20 big blinds deep. And as played, I would not have gotten stacked most likely when I was against 9-7. Whereas if I just bet the flop and I get raised, I have to put my money in and I lose, right? And maybe my opponent did something, maybe he didn't. I don't know. But like, if you watch enough of your opponents and you study enough of your opponents, you'll see them do things. And then in the small stakes games, very often it's just obvious. Like they'll be sitting there and they'll take their card protector and put it, slam it on their chips and on their cards whenever they have the nuts or they'll, uh, they'll perk up quite a bit, like whatever. And you'll see stuff like this, right? Don't give off tells. Don't get tricky. Don't even try to reverse Hollywood. Get all that out of your head. Just act normal. Act normal, put in your raise and your opponent's going to put you on a draw and they're going to re-raise you. I mean, I used to have this like running joke with my friends where every time we would go play a world poker tour event, where very often it's full of satellite qualifiers because a lot of these local casinos, they'll satellite people into the World Poker Tour tournament 
all year, right? They'll have like one 5K per year, one 3,500 per year. Their satellite people in, they get 300 satellite qualifiers. We would just like all 1.5X up or double up in the first two hours almost every time. It was unbelievable how often it happened. And why did it happen? Because the opponents would literally get aces. We would be able to beat aces. And then they would just blast their money in. That's it. It's easy as that, right? Find a spot where they have aces and get the money in whenever you can beat the aces. I know it sounds simplistic. It is what it is. The, I guess, the opposite of this is don't get a hand like top pair bad kicker all in. <laughs> You'll find some spots where GTO recommends like check raising top pair second kicker, top pair third kicker, etc. Don't do that against these players because uh, that may result in you either having to fold the hand or playing a big pot with it, which you often don't want to do. They become a little bit more bluff catcher-y, right? I know it probably sounds horribly unbalanced, only raise the nuts, etc. But um, if your opponents are going to rip it all in with their aces, that's probably what you want to do. All right, number two. They do not bluff catch enough on the river when facing a big bat. Most recreational players want to play for a long time. They just got into this World Series of Poker Tournament or World Poker Tour Tournament, whatever, and they're not trying to go broke in the first level. Now, I want to say, I realize a lot of tournaments are now re-entry, so maybe, maybe this does not apply. Maybe. In freeze-out tournaments, it definitely applies. I can guarantee it applies. Or for people who are not going to rebuy, it applies. Like, again, in World Poker Tour tournaments, right? A lot of people were bankrolled for $50 tournaments playing a $3,500 tournament. They're not re-entering, right? And if you know they're not going to re-enter, then it's basically a freeze-out for them. So if you know they're not going to re-enter, you can apply immense pressure. I remember this article I wrote, must have been four or five years ago now, about a hand I played in the Colossus. I think it was the first time the World Series ran. It was like a $400 tournament that got a lot of players. And it was just like crystal clear to me my opponent had top pair, top kicker, and they were not going to call when the board came out kind of scary. And I don't remember what it was. Like maybe I raised the flop and bet the turn and jammed the river thinking they were going to fold almost everything, something like that. And... They did. I think they actually had top two pair or something and they folded. And um, that was great because I was bluffing, right? But that was a spot where it was really clear to me this player was not going to go broke early in the tournament. I think they actually came to the table. They sat down. They gave us a whole speech about how this was like the big win from their local home game. That All of their friends had 1% of them or something. And this was like the biggest deal of this player's life, right? So they're not going to go broke in the first level. Whenever you decide to check raise them on the flop, bet the turn and jam the river for 150 big blinds, they're not going to call. They're just not going to call unless they have a really good hand. And this player even folded top two pair to me, right? So, you know, if, 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 a lot of players are like this. If you hear people saying things that, as Mark says, just basically makes them wear a sign that says, bluff me. <laughs> uh, if, if they are screaming, this matters a lot to me then bluff them, right? They're not going to call. I mean, maybe they'll call with like sets and top two pair. Maybe. <laughs> but whenever it's clear people really, really, really don't want to go broke, you should look to apply immense pressure. I mean, I've I've done this a decent amount actually and like all of the big tournaments I've ever played, I've played like a little bit overly aggressive. Um, like super high rollerball. I was in there three betting, four betting a lot in the first few levels. And, you know, I didn't really get great cards, but it like worked out okay. Uh, that, those are the only reasons I like treaded waters because I was winning all these four cold four bet pots and stuff, right? Um, I remember, I remember another time I played a big tournament in in London. It was a hundred thousand pound tournament. I was like three betting, four betting a ton, and it's because even most good players care about a three hundred thousand dollar buy in or a hundred thousand pound buy in, right? So anyway, be aware of that, that a lot of people just don't want to go broke whenever they're playing four stakes that are substantial. If you get all of that out of your head, then you can just play good poker. I mean, like I can, I can, I can promise you, I know no one believes this. I just don't even care if I win or lose all that much. I'd like to win. I'm going to try my best to win, but I fully recognize you're probably going to lose your poker tournament when you play a poker tournament. It's just how it goes, right? So you need to get in there. You need to battle a little bit. And if you know your opponent's overfold in general, you should apply immense pressure. Mark says, also, you see people at final tables who have, like, a sheet of the payouts in front of them. Yeah. Like, whatever. Any, anytime anyone does anything that makes it clear that they care way too much about their tournament life, right? So, anyway, they are, they are not going to bluff catch enough when you apply substantial pressure. Now, if you apply little bits of pressure, if you go, like, check raise flop, third pot on turn, third pot on river, and they're nowhere near all in, you're going to get called a lot. So, 
exploitatively, maybe you figure out a way to not put them all in when you are value betting and you figure out a way to put them all in when you are bluffing. Big exploit right there where you can get people to call you a lot with their bluff catchers if you put in like half their stack and you get them to fold almost everything if you put in all of your stack. So figure out what you want and then do that. Um, these players will often find big folds, especially when they have almost no nuts in their range and you do have a lot of nuts in your range, even if they're like kind of unaware of it. But this often happens on scary boards, right? Like say you defend the big blind and there's a four straight on the board by the river, whatever, a low four straight where you need like a seven or something. If they raise under the gun, they have no sevens and they're just going to fold everything, right? So make sure you look for spots where your opponent's going to fold frequently and then win those pots because they're yours to take. Again, this may not apply for some players in re-entry tournaments. Some players may care about the tournament, but they're just going to go re-enter. Sometimes in these World Poker Tour tournaments, you hear people like bragging about how, yeah, last time I was in for six buy-ins and I managed to get even because I took 12th place or whatever. Like They're they're proud of this. They, they make it clear that they don't care if they have to rebuy. They'll torch their money. They don't care. Um, against those players, they may be a little bit call happy, if anything. So, you know, figure out who you're playing against and adjust accordingly, which, you know, goes back to this point. Figure out what each specific opponent does incorrectly and adjust accordingly. These are, again, just blanket statements. Most people care about their tournament life, but not always. Um, that said, whenever the re-entry period is over, if your opponent's sitting there like a medium stack, they're in pretty good shape, especially like going into day two or day three or whatever, where it's kind of like a fresh start and they have a medium stack, they're not going to be going, trying to go broke then even if they aren't afraid to rebuy, right? Because now it's a freeze out and they can't rebuy. So if they think they're in decent shape, they're not going to try to go broke. A lot of people, especially at the World Series of Poker, for example, let's say the main event, which is a freeze out, but even ignoring it's a main, if it's a, it's a, did I say it's a main event? Even if it's, even ignoring the fact it's a re-entry, some players will make day two and be like really proud about it and send an email to all of their friends and post about it on Twitter and brag about how they bagged a top 20 chip stack, top top 37 chip stack going to day two, whatever it is, right? Which is, I don't know, 80 big blinds. So imagine they're bragging about their 80 big blind stack. The most embarrassing thing in the world for them would be to go broke on the first or second or third or fourth or eighth hand, right? So maybe you need to be blasting them because they're going to fold a lot, right? So look for spots like this where your opponents will be emotionally distraught if they have to get out of the way, right? Well, emotionally distraught if they, if they if they lose the tournament, right? If they would be emotionally distraught because they would lose the tournament, because they've gotten so wrapped up in this idea that this is my identity now, then you can make them fold out a lot of the time. Next, multi-way pots. When you raise, expect multiple callers. This does not happen so much in the high stakes games, but it happens a lot in the small stakes games. If you raise, you may find you get four, five, six, seven callers, Okay. Realize that you do not need to win these multi-way pots all that often to profit. If you put in one-sixth of the money, you need to realize more than 18% equity in the pot. One-sixth of it, right? And you got to realize that you, as the preflop raiser, are going to have the strongest range going to the flop more often than not. Because your opponents are not going to call with aces, kings, queens, jacks, ace, king. They're going to three-bet them. But you have all those in your range. So you have a range advantage. And you usually have a nut advantage because you started with a range advantage. Not always, but sometimes. So recognize that you're going to probably win, I don't know, 22% of the time, 22% equity out of that pot. You put in 18, you're going to get back 22, you're going to make money, right? What a lot of people do wrong is they think they're supposed to win these pots half the time or 70% of the time as if it's a heads up pot. It's not. You are going to lose multi-way pots more often than not and that's a-okay. You got to get cool with that. Realize that if you do not have a strong hand on the flop, someone else probably does. And if they clearly want to put their money in the pot, they almost certainly have a strong hand. There was a hand where I was in, um, what was it? I think it was like the 100K recently, where I had jacks. I think it went raise, I three bet, someone cold called, someone else cold called, and the initial raiser called early in the tournament, like 150 big blinds deep. All right, fine. I think the board came like 862. I think I was second to act, or what was I, second to act, third to act, I don't know, somewhere in the middle, checks to me, and I think you can either bet small or check, I bet small, fine, whatever, um, somebody called, then somebody else raised, easy fold, easy fold, 
Yeah, they could have 9-7 suited, but are they really cold calling with 9-7 suited pre-flop? Probably not. They're going to show up with sets. <laughs> it's kind of hard to even come up with very many bluffs, right? They're going to show up with sets. Turns out I was against pocket eights and pocket sixes. Would have lost a bunch of money if I was um, not aware of the fact that jacks are not good when it goes bet, call, raise, right? Sure, maybe they're going to overvalue 10 sometimes or 9 sometimes. Maybe they're going to run some sick bluff with like ace, five of backdoor draw sometimes. They're just going to show you the nuts. They're going to show you the nuts, get out of the way. Right? Um, also in multi-way pots, a lot of people will overvalue one pair type hands. Be aware of that. If it goes raise, call, 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 call. If you bet the flop, they're going to call you with any pair, even though they should not. They're going to call you with bottom pair, middle pair, whatever. Um, sometimes they're going to hit their kicker. Quite often, these players will call down if they don't hit their kicker, and they will raise you on the turn if they do hit their kicker. Makes life nice and easy, right? If you have aces, and you know your opponents have top pair, middle pair, bottom pair, you can bet the turn and then fold if they raise you. Because they're only going to raise when they have the nuts. They're not going to raise top pair, fourth kicker. They're just not going to do it. They're going to call, right? Because they realize you could have aces. So, realize that. Also, there is a lot of content on pokercoaching.com. On, on multi-way pots, I know Matt Affleck has a few good videos that I've watched. Um, in general, on multi-way pots, you want to be betting on the smaller side because the minimum defense frequency is divided by everyone in the pot. But I will say that exploitatively, you probably want to use larger bet sizes in small stakes games because people don't really care how much you bet. They're going to call far too wide, not fat too wide, far too wide. They're going to call far too wide in multi-way pots. So if they don't care about how much you bet, you might as well just get more money in the pot when you are betting with a good, strong polarized range. You're going to find that in general, in multi-way pots, you want to be betting more polarized because you're, you're going to be against like just stronger ranges in general when they do continue. So you want your strong hands to beat their bluff catchers, right? Anyway, there's a lot on pokercoaching.com and multi-way pots. It's a big spot. I realize this, but you do need to get way more well-versed in multi-way pots in smaller stakes games than you do compared to high stakes games. But a lot of people aren't. <laughs> they just overvalue a lot of hands. Next, a lot of players in small stakes games, a lot of recreational players call three bets too often. If they raise king 10 offsuit and you three bet them, they're going to call. They shouldn't, but they're going to. So your first question is, how do they play post-flop? If they will easily fold to a continuation bet when they miss, just three bet a lot. You don't really care if they're going to call your three bet a lot if they're just going to check fold the flop every time. Three betting becomes great then because if they're not going to four bet you without the nuts, you always get to see the flop, right? Unless they have the nuts, in which case you fold and you get out of the way. And then when they do see the flop, if they're just going to check fold every time they miss and they're not going to be putting you in tough spots by check raising gut shots and whatnot, then you just get to win these 10 big blinds or whatever it is off your opponent very, very frequently. And that's great for you, right? So, because of that, you should 3-bet a lot against those players. When I say a lot, I don't necessarily mean like more than the GTO range, but I mean 3-bet the GTO range, maybe a touch wider against these players. I think it's A-OK. -okay. You have to realize, if your opponents will not respond with whatever aggression act, aggressive action they could take at a particular point, like if they raise and you 3-bet, they're not going to 4-bet nearly often enough, you should 3-bet way more often. If uh, you raise pre-flop and they're not going to 3-bet you often enough, you should raise wider. You'll often see some of the best players raising pretty wide from early and middle position. Why? Because people don't 3-bet them enough. If people don't 3-bet them enough, they get to see the flop, they get to better realize their equity, which is going to make some of these normally barely unprofitable hands profitable. So if your opponents are not going to take aggressive lines, it allows you to bet way, way, way more often. Or, you know, allows you to take the aggressive line way more often. So against those players, three bet a lot, continuation bet a lot, and they're just going to overfold and you're going to extract little bits of equity. I remember a long time ago playing against some players, there are a few players coming to my mind, who would just be like hyper aggressive pre-flop. And I'm always wondering like, why, how are they getting away with being so aggressive pre-flop? They just have stone junk all the time. And the answer is their opponents folded too often post-flop, right? They got called a lot pre-flop. And then their opponents check folded too often by the river post-flop. And they just ran them over. Like, I know Faraz Jaka did this for a long time. He would just three-bet everybody. <laughs> three-bet everybody every hand. They would fold a lot, or they would call them. They would check fold a lot. And they wouldn't bluff them nearly often enough. Like, he almost never got raised. So it's quite good if that's the case. Jonathan Jaffe, very similar. He would just blast them. Um, and it is interesting to see these players actually adjust to high-stakes opponents because it turns out they don't do that nearly as often against high-stakes opponents because 
high stakes players play better. So if opponents are going to make this mistake, then you in turn should three bet no lie, right? Um, what about people who play well post-flop? If they're going to play well post-flop, but call your three bets a lot, you want to be three betting more linearly. So like, let's say ace 10 suited is normally a call after your opponent raises. Maybe you want to three bet that. Maybe you don't want to three bet so often with, um, you know, ace five suited or eight six suited or whatever the suited bluffs are. Maybe the offsuit bluffs, maybe not even, maybe you don't even play those. Maybe you just fold them pre-flop, who knows? But if your opponents are going to play well post-flop, meaning they're going to check raise you a lot, maybe they're going to four bet you some pre-flop, whatever. If they're going to play well enough, but call your three bets too often, then you probably want to three bet a little bit more linear so that you just dominate more of their marginal calling range, right? Like if they're going to call with ace-nine offsuit, three betting ace-ten suited is great. If they're going to call with a king-jack offsuit, three betting king-queen offsuit is great, right? So figure that out. Figure out what they do and then adjust accordingly. I know that it's kind of hard to know how your particular opponent's going to play in these scenarios. In general, I would default to presuming your opponents are going to do this number here. They're going to call a lot pre-flop and then fold to post-flop regression, especially just small flop continuation bets. So, you know, try it. Try three betting a lot. But if you go back to the first point I said here, they overvalue premium pre-flop hands. What I typically do is I three bet way fewer weaker suited aces, suited connectors, and I three bet more high offsuit cards as my bluffs. So I'm three betting fewer suited hands as bluffs. I'm three betting more junky offsuit hands as bluffs. So if anything, I'm like kind of more polarized with blockers, right? And I am calling the hands that flop very well because I want them to get in a spot where they where I get to stack them whenever I make a strong post-flop hand with my hands that are most likely to make strong post-flop hands. So if you look at a GTO strategy and involves some suited three bet bluffs, obviously, I'm usually doing that more with like queen 10 offsuit, queen jack offsuit, king 10 offsuit, stuff like that against these weaker recreational players and more calling the suited connectors. Does that make sense? Because I want to play hands that can beat aces and the hands that most likely beat aces well, I want, I want to see the flop with hands that can beat aces, and those hands are suited connectors, suited aces, small pairs, etc. Okay? Cool. Those are the four exploits I definitely recommend you use. Um, the person who sent in this question had a whole laundry list of things they think their opponents do wrong. I, I thought we could go through more of them, but I'm like, ah, we can do that in future webinars because, as you see, we're already 30 minutes into this. Um, there's a lot you can do to exploit your opponents, but really you have to figure out what each particular opponent does. The idea of everybody in my game does the same thing wrong is not really going to hold true. I, I do think these four things are pretty likely to be true, which is why we're discuss we, we discuss them. But at the same time, don't get in don't get it in your mind that let's say everyone calls three bets too often, or everyone doesn't bluff catch enough on the river. Right? Don't don't necessarily get that in your mind because that's going to result in you making errors against your particular opponents. I hope you learned a few things in the how to exploit recreational players when deep stacked video. If you did, do me a quick favor and click the like and subscribe button below. But also let me tell you about my holiday sale taking place right now at pokercoaching.com slash holiday sale. If you learned a little bit in the video you just watched, or if you like my content in general, you can get access to poker coaching premium right now at a big discount. Let me tell you all about it. During the holiday sale, I'm doing something I've never done before. I'm giving my Poker Coaching Premium membership for three months for the lowest price I've ever offered it for, which is 188 bucks. Normally, Poker Coaching Premium is $99 a month, but here you get a little bit more than 33% off because, you know, why not? I appreciate you. Consider it a holiday gift. Also, we're adding something brand new to the site. It is our completely updated 30-day tournament challenge. This 30-day tournament challenge is not for sale, so don't email me asking to buy it. It is exclusively available for Poker Coaching Premium members only. And if you are a Poker Coaching Premium member already, you just have free access. It's included at PokerCoaching.com. All sorts of stuff is just included with your membership. There are no upsells or anything like that. If you're a member, you are getting access to everything. Here are your instructors for this 30-day challenge. You have me. Hopefully, you know me a little bit by now. We have Faraz Jaka, absolute crusher, World Poker Tour Player of the Year. We have Justin Saliba, just GTO. 
He won a World Series bracelet this year in a $5,000 tournament, and he is a GTO master. We have Burt Stevens, one of the biggest winners in online poker tournaments. He just won another $10,000 buy-in tournament the other day. Some of my favorite content in poker coaching is by Burt, where he either streams live playing the highest stakes games for just poker coaching premium members, or where he goes through and reviews his deep runs in the big games. Just the other day, he reviewed a $25,000 buy-in tournament that he won recently. We also have Jonathan Jaffe, who gets in there and battles hard. He's incredibly creative. We have Matt Affleck, who has webinars on poker coaching every week where he shows you, the student, how he studies as a world-class professional poker player to improve his skills so that he stays at the top of the game. We have Lexi Gavin, who's in there battling all the time in the high-stakes live tournaments. We have Alex Fitzgerald, who's perhaps coached more poker players than anyone in the world. And Michael Acevedo, who is the GTO master. He wrote the book, Modern Poker Theory. Our goal with this 30-day challenge is simple. It is to help you transform your tournament game in just 30 days. Each day, you'll watch a video from me or from one of those world-class players I just showed you. And then after that video, you will get a daily quiz to make sure that you are actively learning the key concepts that you need to learn from those videos. So here's what you are going to learn over the course of the 30-day challenge. Matt Affleck is going to teach you how to study and you know, memorize preflop charts so that you roughly know how to play in all preflop scenarios. He also is going to be discussing bubble play and advanced ICM concepts, so you know to take advantage of when there are uh, situations when there are big payout implications. And he's going to be discussing ICM preflop range adjustments and strategies, which is really important. A lot of people think they can just look at our GTO preflop app that we have available for all members. Again, it's just included that gives you GTO ranges for spots where there are no pound implications, but that is not true. You have to adjust to your specific scenario. Lexi Gavin is going to be discussing how to play the early and middle stages of tournaments, as well as how to play the late stages of the tournaments, the various adjustments you should be making to ensure that you are giving yourself the best chance to succeed. I am going to be reviewing all of the main hands I played from the 2021 World Series of Poker main event. Also, we're going to be going through my $100,000 buy-in tournament main event. Main event. Well, it's not a main event. My $100,000 buy-in tournament that I played at the World Series this year. And also two very fun videos that I made recently. One was when to barrel the turn with little to no equity. This is something that I did not do for a long time. If I had nothing on the turn, I would just always give up. But it turns out there are a lot of spots where you should continue bluffing, especially when you have like a random king high. And... I'm working hard to improve my game, and we have a whole video discussing that. And also, we discuss how to master monotone boards, boards that are all the same suit, when you are shallow stack, which is a very interesting spot. Also, Alex Fitzgerald is going to discuss how to play big aces, ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack. A lot of people continuation bet it and blast off every time. Other players check fold every time they miss. All of that is wrong. So make sure you check out that video if you always have a tough time playing ace-king and whatnot. Jonathan Jaffe, one of the most creative players in the world, has a video on, well, finding creative bluffs. I've learned a lot from his videos because he really does get in there in battle. And it turns out a lot of his bluffs are either GTO approved or he's just really good at exploiting the common mistakes most players in most games make. Frost Jocko is also going to be going through his World Series of Poker main event review as well as another live tournament. And Justin Saliba, just GTO, is going to be going through a high-stakes tournament using Pio Solver to go through all of the vital spots. Additional content. We have Matt Affleck and Jonathan Jaffe, where they got on together. And they reviewed the $5,000 buy-in Seminole Hard Rock Poker Open tournament they recently played. Burt Stevens and DraftGanger. Oh, look at this. Here you go. They're going to be going through his $25,000 buy-in win that he had recently on GG. Not his most recent one the other day for... The $10,000 buy-in tournament. This is a $25,000 from a few months ago. So they go through all the key hands in that. And me and Jonathan Jaffe go through hands that we played at the Poker Masters recently in the Poker Go studio. All right, that's what you're going to be getting in just the 30-day challenge on top of everything else at Poker Coaching Premium. This three-month membership that I'm offering you here is the perfect membership if you want to go through one of the newest pieces of content I just made my Cash Game Masterclass. So this is not only for tournament players on our site. We also have a ton of information on cash games. This is a lot of work, a lot of effort, but this course will teach you everything 
you need to know to crush cash games. We'll go through a table of contents here. I'm not going to read through all of it. You can pause the video if you'd like and read through all of it. But we go through the basics, right? You need to know how to count combinations, for example. You need to understand when to play GTO and when to massively exploit your opponent, etc. Also, we discuss how to play before the flop 100 big blinds deep in basically every scenario and how to play 200 big blinds deep in basically every scenario. And then you can extrapolate a little bit for if you're playing even deeper stacked. By the way, if you're a tournament player and you play deep stacked, you want to make sure you check out this cash game masterclass because 100 big blind cash games play kind of similarly to 100 big blind tournaments. So you want to make sure that you are studying this as well. Then we discuss playing the flop. We go through all the scenarios you could possibly find yourself in. There's a lot of situations that come up over and over and over again on the flop. And if you mess those up, well, you're going to be leaving a ton of money on the table. We also discuss the idea of implementable strategies such that you can play roughly like a GTO solver, even if you don't know exactly what the GTO solution looks like. We go through essentially a system that teaches you how to play well in most spots. And it turns out if you pick the best or second best play in almost every scenario and your opponents don't, well, you're going to be crushing them. And it turns out it's not all that hard to find the best or second best play in most spots. We're also going to go through playing all the common scenarios on the turn and also on the river. All right. Finally, additional topics such as playing with a straddle. We're playing with a straddle twice. Sorry, there's so many things I got, got lost here. Um, we discussed things like game selection, seat selection, which are two very, very important things. Whenever you're playing cash games, we discussed the impact of the rake, tells, backing, and much, much, much more. Kind of like the 30-day challenge, though. This cash game masterclass is not for sale. It is just included exclusively for Poker Coaching Premium members. And if you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, you already have access to this right there in the Courses tab. Also, we have my in-depth tournament masterclass. These are long series, by the way. I think the uh, Cash Game Masterclass is something like 40 hours long, as is this Tournament Masterclass. And in this Tournament Masterclass, I teach you everything you need to know to play every stage of the poker tournament optimally and how to maximize your equity. Here's one of our students who recently went out to the World Series and crushed it, Max Dave. He took third place for $241,000 in the reunion, the first tournament out there. He was also uh, came to a breakfast that I had for poker coaching Members, I always host a breakfast whenever I go out to poker tournaments, within reason. And um, we had two breakfasts this summer, actually, with about 40 people each. Max was nice enough to bring me some macadamia nuts from Hawaii, where he lives. That was pretty cool. So anyway, congrats to him. Also at Poker Coaching, we have over 1,400 interactive hand quizzes. If you've seen my videos on YouTube where I go through hand histories, it's kind of like that. And you know how I ask you, what would you do in this particular spot in my YouTube videos? Well, we do that in the quizzes and on every single betting round, I ask you what you would do in this scenario. And then you get a score, right? If you get a whole lot of 10 out of 10s, probably a pretty good poker player. If you get a bunch of zero out of 10s or one out of 10, you probably need to work a little bit harder on your game. Poker Coaching Premium is a very, very long-term project. And so far I've spent over half a million dollars paying my coaches to make content for you over the last few years. And I fully plan on continuing to do that. Here are all of our coaches. We already mentioned quite a few of them. A few we haven't talked about are, let's see, we have Ryan O'Donnell. If you play Spin and Goes, Spin and Goes are a unique form of poker that takes place online. He is an absolute crusher in those, and he has a course on beating that very interesting format. Also, uh, Brad Wilson, wor world-class cash game player. He has a great podcast where he interviews a lot of world-class poker players. Um, so check out his cash game content. And James Romero, absolute crusher, one of the best poker players in the world. He is a genius, and I always love learning from him. Like I said, we continue to add content to the site. Every month, we are spending mid-five figures, which is a lot of money for me and most people to add content to the site. And that's just to make sure that it stays the best training site out there, to make sure I'm giving you all of the best content possible so that you stay at the very top of the game if you work hard and actively apply yourself. You may not know this, but I've actually been coaching a small number of students called my inner circle twice a month for the last five years. I recently closed this down though so that I could focus on helping all of the Poker Coaching Premium members more, which, you know, is not so good for the 
small number of people in the, po in the inner circle, but it's great for all the people in Poker Coaching Premium. And although this inner circle program is no longer available, I actually did record all of my inner circle coaching sessions over the last five years. It's a lot of videos. It's over 240 hours of me coaching my students. So if you join Poker Coaching Premium right now, you'll get my biggest bonus ever, which is all of those 240 hours of me essentially coaching my students of all sorts of skill levels one-to-one. -one. And you'll continue to get access to this gigantic library of one-on-one -on -one coaching videos for as long as you are a member. And you may find that some of the players ask very similar questions to you. Certainly some of the players are going to ask questions that are not necessarily applicable to you, but if you find some of the students in there that seem to be very much like you, my answers to their questions will probably answer all of your questions. Here's another one of our students, Laura Eisenberg. She went out to the World Series this year and won the ladies event for $115,000. Good job, good work. I actually have a video already up on YouTube with her where we go through one of the fun hands that she played there. I know we talked about our brand new 30-day tournament challenge, but we actually have a 30-day cash game challenge already on the site. Realize the cash games can be very profitable if you know how to do two main things. If you know how to play fundamentally sound poker and how to exploit your opponents when it makes sense, you are going to crush the games. And I made this 30-day challenge to teach you how to get those skills so that you can thrive in the cash games. So here's the holiday sales here, what I, what I have available for you. We already discussed the discount on a three-month membership, but you know what? We'll also give you a, month, a, a big discount if you want to sign up for three years. I realize that's a long time. I realize a lot of people in the poker space disappear after six months. That is not how I operate. If you've been paying attention to me at all over the last, um, well, about 15 years, I've been working hard to improve my students' games nonstop. I do not take breaks. I do not uh, relax so much. I work hard on adding value to my students' poker skills and lives to the best of my ability, and I'm going to be here indefinitely. So, if you want to get a big discount, over 66% off of Poker Coaching Premium, check it out right now at pokercoaching.com slash holiday sale. Here's another one of my students, Gershon Destenfeld. He actually asked me to coach him last year because he final tabled the World Series of Poker main event. And he's in a unique spot where he didn't really care about the money because he was donating it all to charity anyway. He does well in life and he just wanted to win a bracelet. There are a few players who do that every year who are in a good financial spot, and they're donating it all to charity. Fine, good. We go there, we study hard, and I teach him a strategy that will result in him either winning the tournament or probably going broke in eighth or ninth place. And wouldn't you know it, he took eighth place. To be fair, I was happy with the way he played. He came in with a relatively short stack. There wasn't anything he could do. I thought he played it fine. But he went out to the World Series again this year, again, donating it all to charity, and he played a shootout. Shootouts are interesting tournaments where... You play each table until there's one player remaining. So that none of the tables combine until one player has all the chips at each table. So let's say there's 1,000 players. You have 100 tables of 10 players. They all play to a winner. Then they have 100 players left. 10 tables of 10. They play down to one table. And then they play down to the winner there. And Gershon used exactly the strategies we outlined and worked on in preparation for his main event. And he won three in a row and won the shootout for $204,000. We also have some content on YouTube featuring him as well. So make sure you check that out. So here's the offer. Here's what you're going to get. If you are a Poker Coaching Premium member, for as long as you're a member, you're going to get live weekly coaching webinars with me and my amazing roster of coaches. Also access to over 1,400 interactive hand quizzes. We upload new ones very, very frequently. Also, we have over 1,000 GTO preflop charts available on your phone, on an app or on the computer if you rather use it there, to make sure that you know how to play well before the flop in all the common spots. We also have over 300 coaching webinars and 185 hand history review videos that will help you drastically improve your skills. And many video classes where essentially I make a video about whatever questions my students have. Usually they're somewhat broad questions and I go through a bunch of topics relating to that broad question. Like let's say, how to play draws on the turn when you are somewhat shallow stacked, right? Or medium stacked, whatever. Difficult spots that cause people trouble. 
And we now have a large library that is searchable where you can type in whatever question you have and it will probably bring up a video giving you the answer to that question. And if you can't find what you're looking for, email my support team because maybe you just can't locate it. But if it's not there, I will make it or one of my coaches will make it in the very, very near future so that your questions are answered. I want to be sure that poker coaching is all you need to succeed at poker if you work hard and you apply yourself. We also have over 65 homework webinars where I ask you how you would play your entire range in a spot. And that's pre-flop, flop, turn, and river usually. And if you know how to go about structuring balanced ranges for both your betting ranges and your checking ranges, you're going to be way ahead of your opponents in almost all games you're playing. Also, if you sign up now, you'll get bonus access to over 240 hours of my inner circle coaching webinars and exclusive access to my 30-day tournament challenge and my 30-day cash game challenge. Also, access to my all-new cash game masterclass, which goes through everything you need to know to crush cash games. I actually learned a lot in the process of making it. We go through all sorts of in-depth GTO spots and adjusted GTO spots to make sure that you know how to play in every scenario you're going to encounter. And we also have my very, very in-depth tournament masterclass, as well as 75 additional poker courses that I didn't even discuss today because... Eh, don't want to take too much time. Look, at the end of the day, if you want to study poker and get good at poker, this is a heck of a value. I made this site to be the site that I wanted when I was first starting to play poker and the site that I want today. That's why I'm actively hiring many of the absolute best players in the world to create content. And, you know, if this doesn't speak to you, then that's okay. But, man, oh man, I wish I had this whenever I was a kid. <laughs> and I'm very, very happy that I have it today. When I say a kid, you know, a young poker player or someone working hard to improve their skills. So look, I made Poker Coaching Premium to give you all the tools and training you could ever need to achieve your full poker potential. If you want to get good, it's here. You just have to put in the effort. And if I fail to deliver on that promise, I do not want or deserve your money. If you're not completely satisfied with Poker Coaching Premium, let me and my team know within 30 days and we'll give you a full refund. 100% money back guarantee this is not some get rich quick scheme or, you know, try to sell you something one time and then disappear. We're here for the long term, actively adding value to my students. And if we don't help you, if, if what we offer does not benefit you, then fine, you get a refund. No problem. I will not be offended. Feel free to ask. Fortunately, not very many people ask because we add a ton of value. I figured out a long time ago, there's a lot of value in helping people improve their skills at whatever you can help them improve their skills at. And it turns out for me, that is poker, which is why well, pokercoaching.com is doing very, very well. So that's me for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoyed the video at the beginning of this show. If you liked this video, click the like and subscribe button, but also go check out pokercoaching.com slash holiday sale. Give yourself a gift. Thank you for being here and I hope you have a great holiday season.